Hey, 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 everybody. Excited to be here. Um, we're going to wait for people to start joining, but if you're watching this on the replay, um, we will be talking about Carl Jung and psychedelics. So we're just going to wait for Johanna to be here, which I think she just joined. So welcome, everybody. Excited to have you here. Uh, Hey, all right, I just sent you an invite, so you should be able to join soon. There you are. Hey. Hello. I oh, know my video is all cut off. <laughs> how are you? I'm well. How are you? Doing well, thanks. Doing well. So today's a special day, right? What's today? Well, it's uh, obviously Carl Jung's birthday, and I just heard that it's also Aldous Huxley's birthday. So Ooh, it's a birthday. great day to commemorate some uh, heroes from the past the gate. Awesome. Happy birthday, Carl Jung and Aldous Huxley. It's really exciting. Hey, Ida, yeah, I wonder, how, I wonder how old Aldous Huxley would have been today. So Jung would have been today 145 since, since he was born in 1875. And, uh, but yeah, so he, he, he passed uh, in 1961 already so it's no longer with us yeah. <laughs> cool well this is my one... first instagram live ever so i'm a little bit uh, uh nervous and excited to see how this goes just uh, trying to read the comments while also um doing the chatting is quite interesting Hello. <laughs> it, gets dis it gets distracting um that's for sure yeah, so um absolutely. If we can't get to everybody's questions or comments, uh, sorry, but yeah, if you've ever done live, you, you could probably know how distracting it is to try to stay in a conversation and, and try to read everything that, that comes through here. Um, so Johanna, do you want to give a little bit of background of who you are and, and um, some of your work so people know? Sure, sure. So um, I'm very glad to see so many of you uh, coming around for this live session already. So as as some of you may know, me and Kyle have been crafting this course on Jung and psychedelics. And actually, it's the second time around that we're doing this because we did it already last summer, but as a beta course. And now we're offering a refined and complete version of that. And I'm a, uh, well, I'm from Finland. I'm a student of psychology and religious studies. And I've been very interested in Jung's works for quite quite some years and uh, yeah i'm very excited to share because i i've been uh, offered through various uh, gateways some opportunities to write and present about these topics such as jung and psychedelics so i feel like i have a um, good touch on the topic already and uh, it's just nice to be able to share the things that inspire you know me so <laughs> it's yeah. glad i'm glad to know that there are so many people who are also interested in this topic yeah yeah thank you and so how did how did your journey start um getting interested in carl Jung and, and psychedelics um well i remember the very first time i encountered carl jung's work and i was in my friend's apartment in london and uh I picked up this book in the morning. I had just stayed over at her place. And uh, I picked up this book in the morning from the bookshelf. And it was Man and His Symbols. And I was a, a psychology student at that time. Um, but I was looking at this book and I was like, wow, what's this? Like, this looks amazing. If you if you guys know this book, Man and His Symbols, you know that it's uh, quite a heavy book. And it's got a lot of illustrations. And it's this beautiful mandala um in the in the cover in this edition at least and i thought wow well i've never uh, encountered anything like this before even though i had at that point already studied psychology for uh, quite a few years um well i think three years or so on my bachelor so uh, then um, i decided that i wanted to go deeper into it and i started to uh, take some courses at the religious studies department because I realized that there's this conjunction uh, of psychology and religion that comes across in Carl Jung's works. And um, 
oh, I am so sorry about these sirens. They might they might be a little bit of a disturbance, but unfortunately I cannot do anything about them. So you just have to bear with me. Um, so um, yeah, that is how I became interested. And then that later on led me to do a master's in uh, religious studies and more particularly in esotericism. And um, while doing this master's degree, I also realized how important figure Jung is for these discussions of esotericism in present time and uh, how his work is really, you know, not not only talking about dreams and um, the unconscious, but also talking about religion and spirituality in a completely new way, which I, I felt to be very um, profound. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, 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 from there I went on to... Um, do an internship at a Jungian Institute in Argentina, where I studied under um, a, a person who translated the Jung's Red Book from uh, German to Spanish. So, mm. and he's a person with very um, profound knowledge on the topic as well. And I was able to spend a few months there learning with him. And uh, an awesome experience. Yeah. Yeah, it was very, very interesting. Sorry, just a moment. I need to <laughs> just, uh, there's a slight background noise that I have to cool. stop. Cool. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, Holly, thanks for, uh, yeah, I guess we could uh, try to pin that up there. Um, thanks for bringing up the topic about the person that got arrested in Denver. Um, you know, I would just maybe get a petition going and somebody else said lawyer up. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's not federally legal as Coastal Chillin saying, but yeah, uh, something that just happened recently. Um, all right, back to you, Johanna. <laughs> um, uh, how did you get interested in, uh, in Jung's works? I don't think I ever asked this question from you. Yeah, I don't think you, you have, and I don't think we really have explored that. Um, Mainly my background in transpersonal psychology. So doing a lot of um, dream work, I studied with a teacher who was a Jungian, but also um, was a student of James Hillman. And so I took like every class I could with this teacher. Um, he was kind of like, well, he was, I was gonna say he was a magician and he actually is a magician too. Um, he goes around <laughs> the world and, and does magic tricks for um, you know, people living in poverty just to try to uh, raise their spirit and whatnot. So really awesome guy. But um, yeah, I just spent a few years uh, working with him in my undergrad and doing a lot of different dream work. Um, and just like uh, active imagination and, and all that stuff. So um, that was my intro. Uh, I'm probably not as well versed in Jung as say you, like I've never really sat down to extensively study his work. Um, I think most of my undergrad was really focusing on um, shamanic perspectives and also uh, the work of Stan, Stan Groff. So that's where most of my energy went into during my undergrad. Well, the impression that I've gotten from the course that you did is that it is also very heavily um, emphasizing Jungian ideas, even though maybe not, you know, maybe you haven't explicitly studied Jung, but at least all of the influences that influences, have come yeah. from him. Uh, because, I mean, he is just this immensely prevalent figure. You cannot really get rid of him, at least if we're talking about transpersonal psychology and um, shamanism and alternative spiritualities it's just the first that always pops up and for a reason i think yeah yeah totally <clears throat> um so yeah we just put this course together um I, you, we have five lectures six lectures called uh, imagination as revelation um and we just released that today so there's a a nice little pre-release going on um, you could check that out by going to the link in the bio and going down to the picture of Carl Jung it says imagination is revelation. So check that out after this live stream. Um, but, you know, so Carl Jung really wasn't wrapped up in, in psychedelia, right? Like there was some speculation that he might have tried mescaline, but the chances are he probably hasn't had a psychedelic experience, but he's also... Um, people really rely on a lot of his theories for integration and maybe understanding the psychedelic experience. So could you talk a little bit about that, even though he, he wasn't really mixed in with psychedelic 
psychedelic culture and psychedelia, why do people really gravitate towards his work for trying to understand psychedelics? Sure. I, well, it's a, it's a great question, and it's basically the premise for why we also put together the course. So, yes, Jung did not take psychedelics in his lifetime, as far as we're concerned. I, I don't think he did. I mean, there's some people who are speculating things about it, but I do think that it's um, quite certain that he did not do it. There's a number of uh, letters um, in which he discusses uh, topics such as LSD, and his attitude is rather suspicious. And this is also something that we will go further in, in during the course, um, of course, because I also believe that actually the reasons for his rejection of the use of substances for achieving altered states of consciousness are rather um, good and that they are based on his personal experiences because Jung was obviously this person who had this amazing capacity for internal um, journeying or what, whatever you would like to call it. And he developed this technique known as active imagination, which Kyle already referred to as. So Jung practiced um, these altered states of consciousness completely uh, through non-substance use. So just, just being sober and, and allowing himself to get carried away with this hypnagogic states and um, that's where he drew the most uh, profound material in his work and he, he has also spoken about this um, and this comes across especially in the red book so yes I forgot to mention that this is the has been my primary focus in Jung's work and it's uh, the red book for those who don't know is this imaginative journal which only came for publication in 2009 and Jung did not want it to be published in his lifetime because he probably felt that the material in it would have been too unhinged for most people around him to ingest because it's a very, very strange book. And in its, in its a sense, or I, I don't know if, it, if it's fair to say in its a sense, but it has resemblances to psychedelic material and to psychedelic journeys. And uh, it, it's also a book with illustration. Uh, and when you look at these illustrations, you are like, wow, this is actually like the word that we would use in this day and age is that like, wow, that's a very psychedelic drawing, isn't it? And it's funny because, you know, Jung did not use psychedelics, but now we would speak about some of the things that he was doing as psychedelic just because they were so experimental and so out there. Um, so why people go to his work um, well, I think there's uh, two aspects to it. Uh, first of all, Jung was a very uh, empirical scientist, and this was the approach that he used in his explorations of altered states. So his writings are very meticulous in a sense, and they're very comprehensive and extensive. And he's also appreciated, and his work on psychology is appreciated way beyond um, depth psychology like he's like a figure such as like Rudolf Otto or Joseph Campbell or even Mirza Eliade he's a he's a very um, profound thinker of the 20th century and uh, I think he has this certain type of legitimacy in also outside of psychology so I think that's one of the reasons why people refer back to him, because despite him having some very out there ideas and writing about very, you know, obscure topics such as UFO phenomena or Gnosticism or alchemy, um, I think the, the wide expression of his work can be seen so easily in the way in which, which we still think about psychology, such as through these notions of introversion and extroversion and the Myers-Briggs um, typology, which was also based on his work. So I think that's one reason. And then I think the second reason is that <clears throat> his uh, work is kind of timeless in itself. At least I, get, I have this feeling about it. Um, and this was also Jung's idea, was that it's not that he invented these terms such as the archetype or the shadow, but rather he popularized them or he brought them to display because um, he thought that these were these 
ideas that were autonomously emerging in human consciousness and therefore he was just putting them forward so i think that there's certain type of timelessness in his work um that is also making him very approachable and uh, for that reason a, a good avenue for any kind of discussion regarding the unconscious or altered states of consciousness yeah and um so we there are some questions and you were talking about the red book correct and if you mm-hmm. look at the red book i mean it is very psychedelic i mean some of the images in there and it makes you wonder like what was going on in jung's life like even in his imagination and you kind of get into this a little bit right like he kind of walk the the tight rope there between like the mystic um and possibly you know the quote unquote like schizophrenic right like he he kind of walk that in those both worlds um Absolutely. and it's just so interesting like i wonder what his his life was like was it full of synchronicity i mean just looking at that book and looking at the images you go wow he was having some experiences without the substance which makes it even more interesting i think <laughs> Yeah I mean it's also very it's it's hard for us to relate because Jung lived at a time prior to technology and I heard just a couple of days ago a clip from him where he speaks about um fo- <laughs> phoning or like phone calls and I had never heard it before and I thought it was very interesting but he was basically saying that um you know it's it's a very weird phenomena for him because he as a psychologist is trying to tell people to come back to their center and back to their core and um to their souls if you if you will and uh, you know even this act of you know being on the phone or you know the idea for him about technology probably would have been just so absurd so we already are living in this age where um you know we are dealing with so much complexity but then you know he was this mind who just spent all his time you know reading some really really heavy stuff and um i think it was my supervisor who who said this like you know nobody in this day and age is educated in the way in which jung was educated mm-hmm. in philosophy and religious studies and mythology and uh, the, all the psychological theories that were known at the time so um I think in that sense his his knowledge was also so um expansive and then that uh, was in dialogue with his imagination also which um was you know quite um profound also yeah yeah there's somebody a little wild back that asked who this course is for and can people in other countries access it so definitely it's uh, available globally it's on our uh website so psychedeliceducationcenter.com and you can um just check out all the courses there and then the course that we're talking about is called revelation as or imagination as revelation um and johanna who's this course for um how would you, how would you yeah, define that also a great great question i would say it's for anybody who is interested in either one of the two in psychedelics or jungian psychology because so <laughs> there was this great comment in the um in in this chat earlier that i saw and somebody was saying like um I, i'm probably going to quote it wrong now so pardon to the person who posted that question but it was something about like um the ethical problems uh in the future when combining potentially psychedelic therapy and uh, depth psychology and that how can we um you know minimize the risks when there's also a lot of untrained people talking about this um these types of uh, topics and um i just thought like well i mean i i would like to think that this course is uh, is intending to promote discussion and to promote a different type of thinking on psychedelic substances which i personally have not really seen much out there and i think this is something that you and me also agreed on that um this course is quite unique in itself and i mean there's not so many people who are talking about the psych- psych- psychedelic experience and jungian psychology even though i think that there's so much fruitful material that can come out of it and i think we both personally feel that um you know ha- having had the outlook of jungian psychology and for you also through 
Stan Groff and to transpersonal psychology has been very integral and important and helpful for understanding psychedelic experiences. And I just think that it would be yeah great if uh, people can draw that kind of benefit from this knowledge. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And I have this comment up here on my computer about the ethical implications that we're encountering between depth psychology and, and um, psychedelics. And yeah, just um, that, that kind of made me laugh uh, because these concepts are used and taught by untrained people. Um, why, ne why the need to add more confusion? And it makes me, it makes me, I was thinking about this pretty recently um, you know, the difference between like depth psychology and more of the, um, this, the psychology that people are taught now, more kind of behavioral, cognitive behavioral. And I'm just thinking like depth psychology has such a romanticism to it, right? Because we're talking about imagination, we're going into the psyche on a soul level, and it's like speaking the soul language versus where we're at now um, in psychology, where we're talking about neuroscience and behavioral changes and, you know, working with your cognition and, and you know, reprogramming thoughts versus like, I think on the level that like Jung, some of these other folks in that depth psychology realm are, are using another sort of language where you're kind of incorporating psyche. And I always come back to Hellman about this. His psychology has just completely moved away from the etymology or the root of, uh, you know, the word psychology is um, soul, psyche, soul. And so, um, I mean, I think there is a lot of richness here. And just even your, your comment about Jung being trained in philosophy, religious study, this and that, I mean, most people that are entering into the counseling field, psychology field, I mean, you don't really get too much philosophy and religious study into it, right? It's all separate. Whereas um, before, you know, maybe that was all kind of combined at one point because, uh, I mean, psychology has a lot of uh, roots in philosophy. And so mm -hmm. when you start digging back in, you know, older philosophies, it's always bringing up, you know, like the spiritual religious matters and what's life and, and this is, and this and that. So I think psychedelics are just really interesting because it brings up a lot of these questions and these experiences. And, you know, I'm saying depth psychology, not death. Yeah. Thank you for uh, pointing <laughs> that out. Um, yeah. Depth. So going down the depths uh, of ourselves. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think, I don't know, moving forward as this field progresses, like I'm really curious to see if some of these theories, um, you know, the combination between philosophy and religion will start to come back into psychology a little bit more to really rely uh, on. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just please go ahead and finish. Oh, no, just more uh, like, you know, we might need to start relying on some of these things because, you know, w what is in the psychedelic experience, right? We get kind of like confronted with imagery, symbolism. We get confronted with, you know, spiritual, mystical experiences, entities. And how do we make sense of that just through like a behavioral cog cognitive approach? I mean, I mean, I guess we could, um, you know, box everything in, say this is all trauma related, right? Like every little image is just fits into the trauma box um, or something that, that happened in your biography. Yeah, biographically. But I mean, there's so much more there at times, I feel like. Um, yeah, I, I think it's also like the sort of the way in which psychology is done nowadays, it sort of somehow reflects on this sort of post uh, modern post constructivism, whatnot, ideas that are just like, um, that we think that we already know everything to that point that we can be so sarcastic and cynical about it, which is not true. It's like, it, there's there's so much more to know. And uh, yeah, I just want to say that I like that you're sort of saying that we have to bring back this discussion on these things between religion, philosophy and psychology, because that was, you know, it was a, a, you know, a topic in the early 20th century. And I'm sure you're familiar with Iranos, um, conferences or maybe you have heard of them i don't know well basically it's a, a like a, jung was also very uh, rudimental in establishing these eranos conferences which first started in 1933 and i was just thinking about it today because these conferences were initially um just intended for discussions on spiritual matters and you know there wasn't yet any kind of connotation on it it was just people wanted to think and talk about religious and spiritual matters, you know, 
in a way that was open and that could be constructive. And later there was also some very influential members such as Rudolf Otto and Joseph Campbell also was part of the Eranos Institute. I'm so sorry. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a one nice thing to remember is that we're also continuing a lineage of something instead of um, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel in a way. <laughs> it's just, just uh, you know, reminding ourselves and others that, you know, there, there is still so, so much to explore in these uh, arenas. Yeah. So there are some questions that we got through our story, um, put up a little question box. So maybe we could switch over and start to um, answer some of these and then I'll go through the Instagram thread as well um, where people might have dropped some questions in there. We're about close to a half an hour. So we'll switch gears here a little bit. Um, yeah, sure. I think we've answered this, but we'll go back over it. I like this, uh, this username, sweet brain juice. Um, was Jung a psychonaut himself or did um, he do experiments with psychedelics with um, on patients? Um, and, Chances are, no, probably didn't use psychedelics on, on patients. But um, I guess, you know, how do we define that word psychonaut? Um, if we break down the etymology well, of that, it's the a sailor of the soul, <laughs> navigator yeah, yeah, of the soul. I, I love this word. And I do think that it is very applicable to Jung as well. I mean, he was definitely, a, you know, sailing away in search of this word soul. And I'm sure as you as, as a if, um, you know, reader of James Hillman, you probably are very familiar with the soul psychology and how, you know, it's a sort of happened that soul just vanished from psychology and we don't talk about it anymore. And uh, I think it's also kind of like a little bit thought provoking and maybe provoking overall to just think about this notion of the soul and in relation to psychedelic phenomena as well. Now that, you know, there's all this discussion on microdosing and, you know, this sort of potential avenue of psychedelics being used as this, um, you know, to enhance our productivity and to become, you know, better members of our society in the standards of the current, you know, whatever civilization um, we are existing in. And that, you know, it's not that many people are still talking about these topics such as the soul. And it's just like, can we... How can we find a new way to talk about it um, or or an old way, so to say? So, yeah, I would say that Jung was a psychonaut because I don't think that word is uh, does necessarily have to have a, a connection to psychedelics. What do you think? Um, when I when I really think about that word, yeah, I think he probably was a psychonaut. I mean, he was an explorer, right? Kind of going into his dreams, using astrology, alchemy, um, and really kind of diving in the depths of himself. I mean, just even looking at, yeah, the images of the Red Book. I mean, he was really deep in his process. And I think, you know, I think psych psychedelics get tied up with that word psychonaut. But I don't know, when I break that down, it's like anybody who's really just trying to navigate their soul experience and really curious um, to go internally and, and just go into those inner worlds um, to navigate it. So I'd say he's a psychonaut, maybe not in the psychedelic sense, but definitely a soul sailor of some sort. Um, Holly asked if I have a profile other than psychedelics today. Yeah, you can. Um, my other profile is Setting Sun Wellness. Um, so you could check that out. Um, Let's see, Anthony at Science and Anonymous he said, is psychedelic-induced psychedelic neuroplasticity viable for neurogenerative diseases? Um, it's a little outside my scope, but um, you, know, you could probably check out some, some research. I know that they were doing some research with um, ayahuasca and Alzheimer's, and I believe there was, um, I think they, there were some ideas about exploring ayahuasca and Parkinson's, but I would just do some research on that if that interests you. Yeah, I would say similar also for Ibogaine. I think that's quite, or it's potentially, there's not so much research on it, but potentially has also these neurogenerative properties. Yeah, hard to be conclusive on that. We definitely need more research, but people are exploring it. Um, somebody asked, can you save this for 24 hours? Yes, it will be up for 24 hours and I will try to save it. Um, this is an interesting question. I don't know if it's Jungian related, but uh, Ruben psychologist asked, uh, what's your view on life, beliefs, or truths? 
And that's oh. just an, in, that's an interesting question just in general, because it's something <laughs> I've actually been getting into um, with some other folks. Well, should we pick on it? Yeah, let's pick on it for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> what do you, where, how, how do you uh, view life? <laughs> oh, wow. That's, <laughs> I wasn't expecting to go to this level during this Instagram life. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> we could pass it. I know it's, it's uh, really uh, deep. Uh, a friend of mine just uh, recorded a podcast with me and his, the question was, how do you, how do you seek truth or define truth? And I was not ready for, for that discussion. Well, so I, I would like to, I would like that. to pick on the one, uh, I mean, I don't, because I feel like whatever I'm going to say about life now is going to sound really corny or some kind of like a paraphrase for something and it's like or like it's an adventure or a journey or whatnot you know it's like a, yeah it can be all of those things um or like a quest or something which i also you know sometimes i experience it like that and then some days i'm just like nah today's a horrible day <laughs> life is not well but anyway i wanted to pick on the truth one mm. um because i think that's uh can be also quite easily related to jung and i um i think that this is also something that i feel that I or I was very influenced by this idea from Jung in particular because he doesn't really sp speak about truths as a general rather his approach was always very um, cautionary in a way so that he he was very um, he, he didn't venture into belief and I think that's something that also separates him from a lot of other people because he he was very I, I would say that he was a very spiritual person without necessarily the tendency to believe in things and then he you know there's this very famous interview in which he says like uh, or the interviewer asks him like well do you believe in god and then he answers like no i don't believe i know and that he had this mm -hmm. like difference between belief and knowing and knowing through experience and i think this is also when it comes to psychedelics is so interesting because it's like this idea of um you know our the way in which people have engaged with religious practices in the past or especially with christianity which you know during the past couple of hundred years has been very much about belief and you know if you don't have that belief then you don't have a religious life and then um for jung the belief was the thing that actually almost disrupted or destroyed mm. the the core relationship that one could have with the unconscious and rather that there was this way in which you could engage with images of the unconscious and with dreams and symbolism without um, belief and i and i and i think it's just like it's a, it's a very profound thing to um think on i, I think i'm using too much of the word profound here but <laughs> so it goes it's hard to tease apart um yeah yeah I, I like something that uh, my teacher Lenny brought up um, during one of our last trainings a few months ago. Um, coming from, you know, this Newtonian Cartesian paradigm and, and where science and, and math is at, it's like to seek what truth is um, and to know about life, you know, we typically start with the atom, all the building blocks, things that we can um, see, measure, define that way. Um, and coming from the, I guess, from his Whiteheadian perspective, is if you want to understand the, the, the nature of reality and the nature of life, start with psyche, start with experience. And so that was a really interesting flip on um, starting with experience and psyche versus starting with atoms. I mean, most people haven't seen atoms in real life. I mean, I guess you see the, the final form of it with like, you know, this cup, but um, have you ever seen an atom have you ever looked through a microscope to see that probably not but you you know what your experience is right um yeah i like i like that i definitely like that i think william james was also in that boat um just you know really like going down to the phenomenology which is also something that is very much um questioned in in psychology since we were talking about the sort of way in which psychology is approached these days and um, phenomenology yeah. is kind of looked down on because it's like well anybody can say anything that their experience is, is but uh, you know that's also just kind of where we have to start and you know with psychedelics especially that's just it must be our starting point yeah i was listening to um some 
some discussion on William James and, and it seemed like part of his philosophy and his approach was that, you know, um, each experience is unique. And instead of using the science and theories to study those experiences, how do you study the experience from the experience to then maybe inform some of the science that comes out mm -hmm. of it? And um, that's, I think, really interesting, right? Like you can't sit there and label every experience as we understand how that goes. Like, I think every experience is unique in some way. And how do you study that unique experience um, mm -hmm. from that experience? experiential point of view. And I think that's what James was trying to like really hint at um, from what I was reading and listening to. Um, all right, we'll move on because um, Instagram ends, us, ends up kicking us off after an hour. I mean, I guess we can hop back on, but um, we'll, we'll uh, try to get through some of these questions. And I definitely want to come back here and get through some questions that people are dropping in the chat here too. Um, so somebody asked, when you're tripping, um, can we see the archetypes? Let me guess, what are archetypes and do psychedelics, yeah, bring, bring them to the surface to, to experience? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> that, no, but honestly, that's such a great question because uh, one funky thing about archetypes is that not only are they so elusively defined, so of course, those who are not familiar with this notion of archetype, it's um, a pattern or reoccurring form but one aspect of it is that it cannot be directly perceived so mm. that we can know the archetype from a distance but we basically we couldn't be able to actually see it in function um, but this is talking about you know you know what uh, would be referred to as the ordinary consciousness so then in the psychedelic experience for instance could the entities be thought of as some kind of archetypes? I mean, that's just absolutely fascinating thing to ponder on. And I don't really have an answer to that. You know, I think it can be helpful to, uh, to frame it in that way, because, you know, oftentimes when you think about archetypes, you think of sort of personified figures, such as the mother archetype or the shadow archetype or the, you know, choker or um, the lost child or you know, whatever you would have. Um, but the archetypes, I think they can also manifest in, in different types of situations or in, in interactions, even in like music or like a feeling or it's like atmosphere. I think all of those things can be somehow archetypal. So um, mm. I do, like for my personal perspective entirely, I, I think that, you know, there's definitely a possibility in psychedelic journeys to perceive some kind of archetypal experiences. And I think that's why this word is also so often used in the psychedelic um, vocabulary, because uh, there, it's very hard to <laughs> describe it as anything else. What's your take on this, Kyle? Yeah, it's got me thinking. I mean, like, you know, when you think about ayahuasca, right, people talk about... Um, you know, mother ayahuasca, and people might have experiences with the serpent um, and feel that motherly energy and have a, a relationship with it. And it's like, is that the archetype or are we projecting the archetypal energy onto this entity that we're encountering? Um, you know, mm -hmm. another, when I think about some of my early psychedelic experiences with psilocybin, having this entity alien encounter and for me, it felt very real. And then later, as I start to, you know, I talk about it, I go, oh, well, that was a very trickster type of energy. Um, mm -hmm. And is it the archetype itself presenting? Or am I projecting the archetypal imagery onto that entity or that um, whatever that is? I, I don't know what that is, right? I, um, I think we all kind of get confused. What is it? Is it? Is it the elders? Is it our ancestors? Is it an actual she thing helps. that's real? <laughs> the machine elves yeah like what is that um <laughs> yeah i think that's that's a question that we definitely cannot answer but it's a good one to keep on mind it's just like how much of it are we actually putting out there ourselves and how much do we think we can see or experience yeah and thanks for chiming in there ito archetypes life comp or complex is life and then 
I'll also just say here, the collective archetypes that emerge from our connection with that experience. The projection comes from the activation. Hmm. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not reading the questions because I get too distracted. I'm just, uh, and I, I've actually built this thing of, of my face mask to hang it up so I can't even see them. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so I just left you completely alone with reading the questions. Um, yeah, I'm not really so sure about this one. Just about Tao. Thanks, Pedro. Uh, I wrote down something about um, other questions that there was, which is kind of lead to that because somebody wrote a question to the chat about um, the if we could talk on the psychedelic experience and the anima archetype, which you already mm. kind of referred referred to as there, with um, uh, talking about Mother Ayahuasca. And um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if you saw this question, but yeah, I, I just thought that that was also quite an interesting one, considering. Well, go on oh no i was gonna say somebody um asked a question around that as well but um not in the uh the the instagram post in the story and mm -hmm. they asked uh, can psychedelics help me progress my analysis and deal with my anima slash mother issues so i, I don't know what <laughs> what the other anima question is but maybe we can link it all together there yeah let's let's just link it link it up well um for me personally I actually like find this anima animus concept of Jung's. Um, it was probably the hardest one, or maybe like not out of order, but um, I really had to think about it a lot. And I also find it uh, it's the most difficult one, perhaps, to really integrate with the psychedelic experience, as Jung talks speaks about it. Because so uh, for those who don't know, anima and animus are basically in a woman, uh, woman's psyche, the expression of soul would be masculine to a degree, and then in man's psyche, the opposite, so that the expression of the soul is uh, the female arch no, the, the female image. And um, for Jung, this is very, very important because on his explorations in the Red Book, he uh, definitely has this particular relationship with um, his soul, and he also encounters this a female um, called Salome, who also represents for him his um, soul archetype in a way. Mm. So regarding psychedelic experiences, obviously the, the presentation of the, of the female or male figure wouldn't be maybe as explicit as in dreams. So because Jung says that oftentimes the anima or animus expresses itself in dreams. So, you know, if you, for instance, dream of a certain you know you're a woman and you dream of a certain type of man it could be an expression of your anima so that there's something that um is happening in the dream imagery or in the dream world that is reflecting on uh, your soul's um, workings as well but in the psychedelic experience it's obviously a whole lot more complex and that you know it's not it cannot be really even visualized in these sort of almost clumsy terms that we are given by Jung um, rather but I do think that there is definitely something especially when it comes to feminine energies in the uh, psychedelic experience because a lot of people describe in many psychedelic experiences especially with ayahuasca being encountered um, with particularly female presence and uh, there's this great book that I actually would like to recommend to you all is um, called The Psychedelic Mysteries of the Feminine and um, it's uh, by Maria Papaspero and Chiara Baldini and David Luke who put together this uh, anthology. And um, in it, they are basically exploring all these different types of female elements in uh, connection to the psychedelic experience. And I definitely think there's so much to, yeah, so much to know about it, but it's, it's again, very elusive. So it's <laughs> rather hard to talk about it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's hard to talk about sometimes, right? Just trying to put everything together. Um, I, and especially when it comes to psychedelics, right? Because Jung wasn't really 
Um, like he, he didn't incorporate psychedelics into his theories and, and experiences. So how are we correlating the two and, and trying to make sense of it? Yeah, I mean, well for, well, for this particular question regarding the mother issues, well, I do think that psychedelics can be, if, if used in a good context, um, can be very helpful for interpersonal um, relationships. And I, I've experienced this myself as well. Um, it's like uh, psychedelics have definitely helped me to um, reevaluate some of the things about the way in which I am with other people and maybe see their perspective in a different way. And I think all of that can be immensely helpful for, you know, working with difficult parental relationships as well. So, um, I mean, I'm not sure if it's the anima in the, <laughs> in the experience that would be the healing element, but I do think that, you know, there can be some um, good work done there with psychedelics for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, <clears throat> I was actually I mean, just I was actually yeah. just talking to a friend of mine last night about an experience I had around mother stuff, um, and I always kind of come back to you know the I, I like Stan's definition of psychedelics of non-specific amplifiers of mental or psychic processes, and sometimes like you know this comes up a lot, especially in our navigating psychedelics course that we teach about intention setting and expectation. And then like how much intention are you putting in to have this certain type of experience of going in to have this experience to work on a mother issue when maybe that that's relevant, but maybe that's also not something that is naturally going to come up. And mm -hmm. how much do you let go of your expectation to really let the medicine kind of show you what needs to come up and really um, trusting that inner healing intelligence, or you know, Stan also calls it like this inner radar, that when we're in these non-ordinary states, it just naturally brings up. And, you know, maybe the anima and the mother stuff doesn't come up for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so how do, we not to, how, how do we not force that process? And how do we allow, um, really stick with whatever process is emerging? Um, so I think that's uh, something I, I think is important to highlight as well. Yeah, for sure. I really like that you brought that up because it's good to set an intention for sure. But I think it's also good to know with, with psychedelic experiences, sometimes your intentions are just crapped, you know. Go, go, <laughs> and, go out the window. Go out never the window. mind that, you know. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing to know. Maybe one thing that I would like to add just to this idea of this, um, you know, uh, uh, feminine element, for instance, is that I do um, view it in a way that since we're living in a culture which has, you know, for the past hundreds of years endorsed masculine traits or, you know, quite strongly, I think that psychedelics can be very helpful for getting in touch for everybody to certain kind of like feminine um, receptive side of themselves. Because first of all, in order to have a really healing experience with psychedelics, you kind of have to surrender in a way. And, you know, you have to um, be able to also listen. I mean, this is what Terence McKenna says as well, um, that, uh, you know, half the time we're, we think we're thinking, we're actually listening. So to be able to like tune in with yourself. And I, I have at least found myself with myself that, you know, psychedelics can also help you kind of come down to your body you know, out of the mind, which is generally considered to be the sort of rational <laughs> throne of the mm -hmm. human experience. Um, and, uh, you know, to get, get a bit more grounded. And uh, I, you know, if you want, you, you can, I guess, classify those as sort of feminine aspects. Of or well. even looking at some of like the research by like Dr. Sam Gandhi and a few others, forget who um, did some of that study, but I just remember talking to to Sam about this, um, just the connection between psilocybin and how it strengthens people's connections to nature and thinking about, you know, nature being very feminine, anima related. And um, yeah. yeah, so how does that get us in touch? Um, there was a comment in here by the naturalist approach. I see the division between real and the, uh, sometimes this, the words start blurring with your background, so I'm having a hard time seeing it. Surreal, ubiquitous. Um, I see it's also the base of the disconnection between us human and our nature. Does Jung talk about it in his works? So the division between real and uh, surreal. Um, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting. I, I think he doesn't really speak about it in those terms. But the thing is that for a, what Jung really emphasizes is that the collective unconscious is an, an autonomous zone in itself. So, you know, he in a way implies that it also exists independently of whatever operations, you know, human beings consider are going on in our day-to-day <laughs> -day sphere. So he, I think that's also like, I was thinking about this word fantasy and it's like the origin of the word is to make something that was invisible before visible. So like to bring something into light. And I think this idea of um, fantasy as being that, you know, like illuminating something from the darkness um, is quite helpful when you're thinking about somebody like Jung, because basically he was like this, you know, going out in the, into his dark mind with the torch and just pointing at different things. And then, you know, they took form, but he definitely did not consider them as unreal. Rather, I would say that he saw or he considered, or maybe he was willing to consider all of these um, realities of his imagination as re equally real as his day-to-day -day reality. And I think that was the thing that enabled him to go so deep and also to write about these things in such a way and to be so um, inspired by his experiences to sort of the, to entertain the fantas fantasy as um, reality. So yeah, I think that distinction is absolutely vital for um, Jung's thinking. Awesome. Um, Johan, I'm wondering about your time. Um, do you need to get off here in the hour? Do you have any more time? Um, we we could go on for a little bit longer. I think that at some point I'm going to go out for a walk. But, um, cool. We're like, going to get kicked off at it. Instagram usually kicks you off after an hour. Mm -hmm. So if we want to hop back on here and answer some more questions, I definitely see some other questions here that are um, really great. That would be fun too. So um, yeah, should should we do another half an hour or so, folks? Um, yeah, we that sounds great. I if, mean, it would be, I'm very glad that people have joined, and it it would be lovely if we can at least answer everybody's questions. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm going to write one, a couple of these down, so we don't lose them. Yeah, thanks. For um, that. I guess while I'm trying to track some of this stuff, and before we get kicked off here. Um, see what else did people uh, there was one more question on here from the story um, by fractal fitness um tim what up tim um what does young have to say about the ability to break down this uh spec spectacle psychedelics offer so like the visions and the sorry sorry break <laughs> breakdown of the spectacle yeah so the ability to break down spectacle psychedelics offer. Um, okay, I'm not really sure if I will understand this question <laughs> in the way that it's intended, but I can answer something. Um, I, as in, well, I'm, I'm thinking about like the the colors, the the visual aspect. So, um, oh, does nice. Young have anything to say about the the display, the visual? Um, aspects of psychedelics or how could we use his theories to well, understand what's that? What's really interesting is that um, obviously Jung wrote quite a lot about mandalas and he even you know wrote uh, an entire book on the psychology of mandala image uh, and I mean the thing is that even if you like you can definitely like most people when they have closed their eyes closed and if they would really do some kind of meditation I think some kind of mandala or at least symmetrical fig f images can totally appear. And then, you know, when you go into psychedelic states, all of this gets so much more emphasized. So the way I see it is that the imagery that can appear during the psychedelic experience, it sort of feels like it just kind of pops up, pops up like you said, you know, as an amplifier of the psyche. So I do think that that capacity to experience that type of visions or hallucinations if you like uh is something that we have as innate and that you know some people are just more susceptible to that type of um experience 
So, I mean, Jung, Jung writes a lot about the mandala and he personally viewed it as a symbol of wholeness because he thought that there's these four different parts. He also considered a lot about the quaternity, so the number four, and it's sort of it being this kind of solid ground and the kind of like a, like a root of divinity, if you may. Sorry about the sirens. No worries. <laughs> uh, Maybe you, you're gonna, should I mute myself for the duration of them? Now that's the only one in an hour, so this is actually going really well. <laughs> um, city, city. So um, yeah, in, I uh, would recommend checking out his uh, book on, uh, on mandalas. I think it's called The Psychology of Mandala. Cool, Psychology of Mandalas. Yeah, you know, the, the mandala is one tool that we use um, after a breathwork session. And, you know, sometimes you do get these visions and, and what is it like to put put it down and work with those images? Um, and our our teacher, Lenny, has a really interesting story. I don't know if it's necessarily anything that he saw during his breathwork experience or he was just intuitively listening to his body to draw um, and create the mandala but it ended up being kind of like a premonition of some sort. Um, and so he put this just random drawing down and then years later going back to it and um, seeing that all that was right there. Um, and it had to do with a, a cancer diagnosis. So, um, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting story. And so, you know, sometimes we think like, Oh, like I'm doing this artwork and it just, it, you know, I'm not good at art. I don't really know how to put these images together, but I mean, these were just a bunch of squiggles that he had down on the paper and he really didn't know what he was drawing, but trying to stick with that intuitive process to listen to the body and just put it down. Um, and then years later, um, after he had a little biopsy done, his wife was like, Oh, you should go back to that mandala. And then he went back and the way he drew um, this line was kind of like his stitches. Um, and then I guess he drew some, uh, like a cluster. And I guess the, uh, the, the cancer uh, metastasized up in his tonsils. And in the picture, it was exactly like where the tonsils would be if you were looking at the face. Um, mm. And he brought it back to his doctor during the time. And they even thought it was really interesting. They're like, Hmm. because they, they were having a really hard time trying to find what was going on. Um, so it also possibly gave a little bit of insight as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that, that uh, you know, art therapy and uh, these mediums of expression are really fascinating because, yeah, I, and Jung also believe this, that, you know, our intuitive function is the one that is, connected to some kind of divinity and that w in order to um how would i say it so basically that we have to work with all these different types of tools primarily with dreams but then you know also with art and um different types of meditations in order to get access to that but the, you know he also argued that that is something that most people have within their access if they are willing to explore it. And I think with psychedelics, that, that can definitely be uh, enhanced. Yeah, awesome. Um, Rebecca, recommended readings for somebody to go into psychedelic integration. Whew, that's a big topic. Um, you could start by checking out our course. That, that always is helpful. Um, we have a course called Navigating Psychedelics where we go into a lot of stuff about <clears throat> integration. Um, but I really like Stan's work, uh, Stan Groff's work. Um, just uh, gives a good overview of some of his clinical work and, and early work with LSD. Um, and I mean, integration is a huge topic. And, you know, this is something yeah. that we, we, we chat about often, like, what is integration? When does integration start? Like, and there's just so many different ways to go about doing it. So, um, you know, if you were, you know, a therapist or a coach that wants to work with people with integration, I mean, like, you know, you could even start with like, just reading a lot of Jung and understanding these different um, theories and modalities to work with the psyche. And so, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe that's another conversation. I don't, yeah, I don't know I time. It's... here, which is also very relevant for us. Um, the confrontation with the unconscious. I hope you can all see it. 
and uh, that this is by Scott J Hill who is also um the pioneer pioneering uh, psychedelic jungian author and i do think that this book is quite useful also for integration especially for we're getting kicked off here in 15 minutes or 15 seconds so uh oh. yeah join psychedelic us again check this out <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll hop back on here to answer and if you can't join us uh check out our course at psychedeliceducationcenter.com imagination is revolution